Okay, aortic regurgitation. This is pretty much the opposite of aortic stenosis. With stenosis, we said it gets all hard and it's hard to uh, open enough to push that blood through. With regurgitation, blah, 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 it just regurgitates, meaning that it doesn't close tightly enough to allow the blood to stay in that needs to stay in or not backflow. Okay, so for example, here's your valve, right? With aortic regurgitation, the valve is pretty much incompetent. It doesn't know what it's doing. It doesn't work right. It'll open and then it might stay open too long and so the blood will flow through but then it just kind of backflows too. It's like whenever you regurgitate your food, you know? So like you eat something, you sit there for a minute and then you ugh, and you feel it come back up. It's not supposed to do that. Same way with valve function. It's supposed to close so that the blood doesn't come back through. Okay? So the valve is not closing tightly. Blood can leak backward. This can happen because of damage to the valve or the cusps of the valve, each side of this here, or the cusps. So one cusp, one cusp creates a valve. Damage to either the cusp or the valve itself from rheumatic carditis or endocarditis, maybe following syphilis, age-related stretching. Um, somebody gets older and it just isn't as firm as it used to be. Um, history of taking fin fin can also result in um, valve regurgitation. Now we're still talking about the aortic valve, which is the one that um, leaves the left ventricle and um, goes into the aorta in order for the blood to go to the rest of the body. So this is a very important one for us to have one directional blood flow, right? Because we need that blood flow for the rest of our body. So what happens is that the um, backflow of the blood is going to result in a decreased cardiac output. Fluid overload is then going to build up in the left ventricle. The ventricle will stretch and enlarge, heart's working as an ineffective pump, and you could eventually end up with some heart failure on your hands. Um, so we really need to figure out if this is happening, what is happening, what's caused it, and how to fix it. The signs and symptoms of it that are going to alert you to potential aortic valve regurgitation, um, you're going to notice tachycardia as the most early sign. So the patient is pumping very, very fast to try to achieve the same amount of cardiac output that it would before it had a malfunctioning valve. Does that make sense? So if the heart pumps regularly with a functioning valve, they achieve roughly 4 to 8 liters per minute of cardiac output, right? If they have a malfunctioning aortic valve, it's just regurgitating back and forth, then their cardiac output can decrease substantially. And so the heart's going to have to work so much harder to try to get the same amount of blood out. They might experience some palpitations when they lie flat or on their left side because that is where their aortic valve is located. Maybe some dyspnea, um, shortness of breath, maybe some chest pain or angina. They, you might um, notice some flushed or moist skin on your patient, irregular radial pulses because of the change in cardiac output visible heart contractions, like you can see their heart literally beating in their chest when you look at their bare skin. Um, a heart murmur, that's just caused by the turbulent blood flow backwards and forwards um, through that aortic valve, and you can hear that when you listen. Um, make sure you do go back online and on the point and listen to what a murmur sounds like so you can um, identify that. Diagnostic tests we can do to try to um, get a definitive diagnosis and see what is really going on with this patient um, is a cardiac cath. Um, the cardiac cath, like I said, we will show you the procedure here in a little while, but um, they go up through the femoral vein and um, it travels up into the heart and they're able to see what's going on within the heart. And it reveals a high left ventricular pressure because of the buildup of the blood in that, um, in that ventricle. Sorry. Lost my train of thought. Um, a chest X-ray is going to show us some heart enlargement, and an EKG is going to show us a tall R wave um, and a depressed ST segment. Just file that away. We'll look at it when we look at EKGs. Um, an echocardiogram is going to show us a decrease in the valve function. To treat this, we want to give them, again, digoxin, some anticoagulants, maybe some antiplatelets to help thin the blood and prevent it from clotting. Because anytime blood pools in one specific area, it has higher potential for clotting. Because it's all sitting there, all together. It's not being forced through and keeping that good, steady stream of blood flow. It's pooling. And so all those platelets in there are going to form together and aggregate and maybe 
cause a potential clot, which is not good. So we might need to get them some anticoagulants and antiplatelets to pre prevent that. Antibiotics, anytime um, we do a procedure to diagnose or treat, um, is going to be great because, again, the blood is pooling, and so we're not having, you know, that nice um, flow through, which can help to filter out some microorganisms. So if it's pooling there, they have a higher potential of developing some kind of infection. So we need to give them sometimes some antibiotics just to help fix that. All right, I'll be back in a minute and talk about mitral valve disorders. See ya.